everybody live and in person. So welcome to our museum and our home. So I don't know if many of you were part of our annual fish fry, but we just had a wonderful fundraiser out in the backyard here back in October, which was an amazing success. So if you joined us, we want to thank you. It was just a fantastic success. So Roger Block is here, and he has given presentations before, but this is a new presentation. And we are so glad to have him here. And I just want to introduce him, and I'm going to give this over to you. Okay. Thank you. All right, everybody. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I moved down here in, in 1970, roughly, with Honeywell. I was uh, had a PhD in, in Minnesota and was in other degrees in Wisconsin. I was their rocket scientist for 35 years here. And I just happened to be lucky in timing because I got involved with the design of all, all the flight critical components of the shuttle, space station, and all the big programs that have gone on before here. So, I had a great career in aerospace, but I always had, even growing up in Wisconsin, I had this, my parents always took myself and my twin brother to Indian powwows throughout the state every summer. And so I had this great, uh, let's say, attraction to Native American history, culture, and spirituality. So as I was winding down my career at Honeywell, I started another career into a Native American history, heritage, and Spirituality, and have now, uh, through books and traveling for 30 years now, working in, with Native America, uh, taught at St. B. College and Eckerd College in their adult edu education program, early program, uh, all about their 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 world and their worldview. So then I joined the Archaeological Society here and in this historical society, and for 20 25 years I was their president and treasurer and all that stuff. So. I'm really now an archaeologist, historian, Native American, devotee, let's say. And so what I'm going to talk about now is from my archaeology experience uh, over the last uh, 20 years in Canelo's County. And there's all kinds of great sites here. So let's, let's begin with that. Uh, so they asked me to, uh, or I, I suggested a, a discussion of the tribal group that was here when the Spanish arrived in Pinellas County, which was 1528 with the Narv Narvaez expedition down on Park Street. Park Street. They supposedly landed at the uh, Jungle Prada area, and uh, that was the first step of, uh, let's say, a formal expedition into America, into Florida. Uh, and then from then on, others came, like Menendez and a whole bunch of other uh, Spanish expeditions looking for gold. And what, what so the Tocobaga was the tribal group that occupied Tampa Bay. And uh, it was the name that was recorded in Spanish. Every expedition that came in here, the way the Spanish ran their expeditions into the New World, they sailed over in a boat, they had a full, they basically was military people. And uh, they, every, uh, every expedition had a leader, like, like Narvaez was the leader of that one, and he had a a, uh, a secretary, or a what they call a chronicler, who wrote the diary and recorded everything they saw and everything they did. So that when they went back to Spain, they could report to the king, this is what we saw, this is what we had. And most of it was no gold. So that was, that was a good thing. So anyway, uh, so a lot of this uh, is information from the uh, Spanish diaries from these expeditions, which are now all translated, and I've got several right here. Uh, which I've, uh, because that was an eyewitness to, to, the, to the history of the people here. Anyway, they, they called themselves, and this, this eyewitness, and I'll be talking a little bit about him a lot, his name was uh, Fontaneda. Get this, he was a teenager uh, in the early 1500s. There was a shipwreck down in the Keys, and they, all souls were lost except him. He swam to shore, so he was a like a 15-year-old Spanish kid. He was captured by the Calusa, which you'll, you'll, know, you'll see that they were the, the, the tribe that was just south of us here uh, in, in Fort Myers. And he spent 17 years as a slave to the Calusa. Mm -hmm. And what was beautiful is that 
He learned the language of the Calusa, and he learned the language of the Tokabaga, and, and in all that time, he was a, uh, he really was knowledgeable about Florida, because most of all these expeditions, they kept get on shore, there's no gold, they keep moving on. They're here only for a few days. If there's no gold, we're going north, you know? And so they were just, they were just witnesses, but they don't know what they're looking at. You know, they're, they're looking at a bunch of Indians, and you don't really know. They're just a bunch of aborigines there. But he lived with one of them. He knew their language, and he could talk to them. So his, his authority, his diary is very authoritative, because he, he spent 17 years living with them. So it's, it, it's, it's, it's good stuff, rather than just someone walking by and saying, I saw these Indians. That, that's, that means nothing in history. OK, so I'm just, I'm just yakking. Okay, so so a lot of this is from uh, some of this is from Font Uh So okay, so he, he recorded in his diary here that the tribal group within Tampa Bay was the Tokubaga, and and they they lived they, they controlled an area from Tampa Bay down to basically Sarasota up to Ocala and far east as uh, Disney World, <laughs> you know, in Orlando. <laughs> Disney World wasn't there at that time. So so. Uh, it was this, the, uh, the, and the, ch the chief was called uh, uh, Tokabala, Tokabala Chile. That's what he writes right in his diary here. That's what they called him. And he was located at, uh, up in Safety Harbor, uh, where Philippi Park is now. That was his main village. And he was the head of all, and he controlled about 50 villages throughout uh, the, the Tampa Bay area. And that's all written by Fontaneda. So it's authoritative. You know, it's not just somebody's guess walking through. And they had regional rivals, and, this, uh, and we'll be mentioning these in a second. The Ocali, which were up near Ocala. You know, a lot of these cities we have now are based on the former uh, you know, uh, Indian name. Like Apalachicola, there's a tribal group up in the Pantheon you see is Apalachic. And, there's, uh, and, and so anyway, and there's no, there's no Tokabaga city, but that's OK. Uh, uh, and then, and, you know, there were, and when we say regional rivals, you know, you know, a lot of historians think, well, these, these, these various tribes competed, they, and they, they fought each other, and you'll see as we go along at the end here, there was no war. It was basically pushing back and forth without hurting anybody. You know, it was just ex exposing them to force. And so, because we're we'll talking about a lot of their burials, and their bodies show no force trauma, except for normal human accidents, and wife and uh, husband battling each other. It wasn't warfare. <laughs> okay, so, so let's go. So, so here's a beautiful uh, rendition of, in the 1500s, uh, by Ted Morris, a, a great artist, he's represented in, in a lot of the art here, uh, of, the, of the tribal groups that were in, the major groups in Florida, uh, in, in, in the 1500s when the Spanish arrived. And as I said, the Spanish arrived for 1528. And, uh, and so, you know, here, here you got uh, the Pensacola tribe, you know, up here in the Panhandle. You got the Appalachia here, Tamuqua, uh, the Ocali, where rightfully near, uh, uh, just north of us, where Ocali is. The Calusa down here, and we'll be talking about that's where uh, uh, Fundaneda was a captive. But he, he traveled all around Florida he, he had freedom to travel. Even though he was a slave, he had freedom to travel and he recorded all his thoughts. And so anyway, that's, that's, and there were many other tribes, but those are the major ones in the 1500s. Okay. Okay, so at this time when the Spanish arrived, but in this period of time, about 600 years, uh, uh, up until when the Spanish arrived in the 1500s, the archaeologists called it the Mississippian culture. It was, it was, it was based on, it was the uh, uh, Chieftain Society, uh, and this Mississippi, oops, oh, sorry, oh boy, got my pointer. Uh, the, uh, the oh, here, I keep, I gotta go back. Okay, uh, I'm going the wrong way around. Okay. Ah, oh, boy, why am I? I went too far, I must have put my finger on the, on the thing. Too long. Okay, there we go. Mississippian. Uh, you know, they, they classed it, you know, they, it, it, and it, this Mississippian culture, 
existed in Florida, but throughout the whole southeast, all the way over to the Mississippi River here, all the way up into the Great Lakes in, in Wisconsin, where I was born. So Mississippian was a major, major Indian cultural period for much of the uh, eastern United States. And uh, uh, so it, it would be, uh, and they call it, it down in the south, they call it the southeastern ceremonial complex. It's basically a chieftain society. They all spoke a little different in languages and different landscapes, but they all observed a chieftain hierarchical society. You know, the tribe was run by Lake Tokopaga, uh, an area of, you know, of a quite a good area right in the Tampa Bay area, but he was the chief of all his, his people. And, and when we say chief, uh, it's not as if he got elected. Uh, the people just decided that he was the best one to make decisions for themselves. For, for their health and safety. That's what all Indian chiefs are. You, 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 who do you want to follow? Who do you want telling you what we should be doing? And he always had a chance to change his mind. But he, he was always, wasn't elected, he was just accepted and you followed him. When he says it's time to go, you went because he had wisdom. Okay, so anyway, uh, and so uh, Chief Tokobaga lived uh, in, in, in Safety Harbor uh, building site and archeologists call, you know, uh, you know, the, the ceramic pottery they made there, the, uh, the, the Safety Harbor uh, pottery culture. But it's really a Mississippian culture because it goes all the way up into the Midwest here. Okay. Okay. And so, before, just before the Wheaton Island, in fact, I said they started, this culture started around 900. Before that, in the five, roughly 500 to, or 200 to 900 AD, uh, in Tampa Bay, it was, it was the archaeologists classified as Wheaton Island culture. It's a, it was a different culture. It was earlier culture, and they, and they call it Wheaton Island culture because it was discovered at Wheaton Island out here in Pinellas County in 1924. And it was a fantastic culture, but it was not run by chiefs, but by priests, by a religious leader. Uh, you know, they had very f uh, few villages, uh, much lower population, so the leader was the spiritual priest, and he made decisions for you. Uh, and so that's kind of interesting. But what was fascinating about the Wheaton Allen culture is that, uh, that they, they have, they made this beautiful pottery for burial. There's no better uh, ceramic culture in all Native American history than the Wheaton Allen culture discovered right out here at Wheaton Allen in Pinellas County here. And it was all found in this huge burial mound uh, there. But the Wheaton Island culture extended all the way up to uh, North Georgia and all of Florida was covered by Wheaton Island culture sites, but run by priests. And the only reason I brought that in is because the pottery, the burial pottery, every person was wrapped in a bundle and they put one of these fantastic pots to accompany them to the other world. So it was a fantastic, fantastic culture, but run by a priest. Uh, and so, uh, and it's still the finest ceramic art in all of uh, Native America. Okay, okay. So let's now go back to Tokobaga. In other words, the Tokobaga emerged uh, around 900 from the Wheaton Island culture. And why did they have to do that? Uh, let's see, did I miss it? Okay, yeah, I guess I missed it. I'm not, okay, we'll, we'll get to this a little bit here. Um, I'm going to be talking to this here. Uh, the, the Toko, the to, now we're going back to the, 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 when the Spanish arrived here in the 1500s, the, the, the Tokobaga. I just wanted to say that the, 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 uh, the Tokobaga culture emerged from this priesthood led to a chieftain society. And, you know, and, and we've talked about this before. You know, uh, and, and this is per the, the notes of Fontaine, the Spanish slave who ultimately got that state. Uh, below the chiefs were sub-chiefs, shamans, you know, all the, all the fishers and hunters, the, the, and warriors, captured slaves like uh, Fontaine, and a unique group. And this is what's so fascinating, as my researchers said, that, that you had all these, you'd expect in a chief inside, the hit guy, he's the chief, He's got sub-chiefs managing different uh, groups in, 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 in uh, let's say, villages across Pinellas County. 
you got a bunch of priests called shamans, and then all the hunters and the gatherers and the fishers, and 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 because in this area here they ate seafood. And we'll talk about their diet in a minute. Uh, but then you had a unique group called Two Spirit People, and this is what I want to spend a little time on because it's it's pretty special stuff. Uh, it's it's the term for transgender. You know, and they were actually accepted as a very key person in the tribe. This is what's fascinating to me. Uh, and, 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 you know, two spirit is the new word for, in Native America, for a gay and lesbian, let's say. You know, they don't like those white society terms, they want their own term. And so, so in, the, in, a tri in a tribe like this, you will have always two spirits. It's just statistics. And, but they weren't rejected, they were welcomed because they were, had special qualities according to you know, the Native Americans thought they were almost empowered with uh, uh, very special powers. So, uh, and I'm going to share some notes here. Uh, they assisted the whole, you know, th this society as well as the Wheaton Island Society was heavily tied to uh, properly burying the people. If you didn't bury them properly, their spirit would wander alone forever, never reaching, let's say, the spirit world, where our life, in our term, heaven. They would wander alone, not with their ancestors, but caught up in some spiritual space that they never joined their ancestors or their future uh, family who passed away. So that burial was so critical to this whole concept. So anyway, the transgender or the two-spirit people were the people that helped the shaman prepare all the bodies. And these were really strict rules. So anyway, anyway, you know, typically uh, uh, the two-spirit people, this is what they would do in a village like this. Uh, they were, uh, and, and what they mean by two-spirit is that, uh, is that a, that the, a person has a female and a male spirit in one Body. That's all it means. That's all it means. That they're, they're, they share the characteristics of both sex. The two, the two spirit people were the healers that helped the, med, the doctors, the medicine men. They were grave diggers, undertakers. They buried the deceased. They conducted a mourning, mourning for sad, sadness rites. They were conveyors of oral traditions. They were nurses during expeditions and battles. Uh, they foretold the future. They had apparently, they believed that they had a, a lock on to telling the future. Uh, and they made, uh, they did matchmaking. So all the, they had, the, 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 these uh, Tokamaka and other tribal groups at this time considered two-spirit people to be unique and special, not to be shoved away from society, but to be embraced and exploited for their skills. It, it's, it's a really a special little, um, version of that. Piece, piece of, okay, so anyway, get off of that subject. Okay, so, but this was a warrior society at this time. Remember, we, we were talking about Tokobaga, so it's chieftain, and so it's a hierarchical society, which is the, ch the chief and then sub chiefs all the way down. The warriors that they had functioned just like our current military and police. The, the, mili the current military keeps uh, let's say, protects their boundaries for their hunting and fishing areas from the Calusa and from the Okali. And the, uh, uh, and then they would control uh, the people under, the chief says we should do this, and if someone objects, well then they kind of control them like the police do here. You know, if, you, if you go against the chief, you, 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 you just, uh, you know, you're not gonna get your way. So it, it's just that it, it's basically the, the, this, tri this tribal uh, function was the, the military and, and, and police were part of the warrior uh, responsibility. Okay. Okay. The tools they used. <coughs> they hunted with bows and arrows uh, and leftover from the paleo days, they, they hunted with, uh, with spears and spear throwers. Here's, here's an example here, I've got one over here that the museum has, but it's just a stick. And then you take a stone carved napped point, and it's got a, you just put it on the end there like this. And now 
You take a spiritual order, an archaeologist called this an AB level, ATL, ATL, stupid name, but, but it's a spiritual order. You know, and, and so what happens is that, uh, that if, a, if a Tokubaga warrior threw this, he can throw that at about 30 miles an hour. Big, strong guy. Uh, but, but that is, is not sufficient to take down uh, some major uh, animal. So this is what this spiritual order is all about. You got a prong on the end with a with a uh, cutaway knife, and now that warrior can throw it at 100 miles an hour because his arm is two, two foot longer, and it can now penetrate and kill very easily. So even at that time, they they had spear throwers, but the bow and arrow was so much preferred because it was so much easier to handle, and and the aim as well too. So anyway, but they, they still recorded that they used spear throwers and darts. Okay. Get that here. Yeah, I got it. Kristen. Right, thanks. Yeah. Okay. We're good. All right. Okay. So, uh, so according to uh, this, this, and so this was a hunting. This was a fishing society. They fished with hooks, shell hooks. They didn't have metal, so they had nets, and and they would chase. They would have uh, like uh, nets out in the water. They chase the fish in, and then they they close off the thing, and then they could go in and actually grab them with their hands. Uh, uh, they they had uh, tools like this, a stone. Selt, you've seen that in archaeological hunting, but they take a handle, bingo, and you got a nice thing to a club, a manatee, or a shark to death. Uh, uh, they would have shell tools, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, we'll get to that. Uh, but their preferred weapon was the bow and arrow. And according to uh, the Spanish chroniclers, and right in the uh, Fontaneda, Diary here, he says, the bows were approximately six, seven foot long, used deer, deer uh, skin um, bowstring, and oak bows. And the Spanish soldiers who were, came through here, and even Fontana, they could not pull the string back. The bow was so strong. But the Togo Baga men, as easy as pie, because they had, they had all the muscular, all the training from youth. And so, even though you think of the Spanish conquistadors, they are conquistadors in our world. Uh, they're trying to find gold in, in uh, you know, basically conquest uh, cultures. It was easy for the hunters, but the Spanish military, they couldn't even move it. Uh, let's see. So, okay. Uh, so they were, they were the Togapaga men, the warriors, and were, were apparently very, very strong compared to the Spanish. Remember the Spanish, well, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that when you talk about the burials, were, were uh, no more than five foot tall. They were, you know, because they had lived for countless centuries in Europe, suffering all kinds of uh, famines and all that, and they, their nutrition was, uh, was, was not the best. They were living off the land, they were living off a bunch of uh, uh, bad diets, and so they were short and stocky. And so they, they called, the Tokobaga giants in his thing. He calls them giants. Uh, so anyway, that's kind of an interesting take. And, and this, is, this isn't just uh, from burials and like archaeology. This is from Fonneda, the eyewitness. And he could speak the language. So it's authoritative. That's what's so important. OK. Oh, here, went too far. OK, so the diet was this. 40% shellfish. Because why, why that? Because it came, it, it re resupplied every day. Right in Tampa Bay, right on the, uh, in the Tampa Bay, and out on the Gulf. Every day, more fish, you know, shellfish came in. And so, you know, they had all these shellfish, uh, scallops, crab, shrimp, fish, all these fish, always there every day. You didn't, you didn't you know, like if you had a, a field of corn and you harvested it, it's gone for the, until the next season. That comes every day back to your doorstep. And so they didn't have to go through for it. Yeah. They, didn't, they, weren't, they were fishers, not agriculturalists. Uh, 
And, and we find in the archaeological context bones from all these food sources that were in, in, in the trash dumps, which are what we call midden. Archaeologists call it a midden surrounding the village. And uh, it's the waste dumps. And so you find all these bones from all the, the food here uh, in those middens. Very limited corn production at that time. The rest of America was all raising maize at the time because they had come from, uh, learned how to uh, do fields from Mexico, bring maize up from, from Central America. But in Florida, they didn't need to do it because it was the fish was there every day. Why build a field when you can go out and catch the fish coming in every day? Uh, and uh, but they did make bread out of the, the roots uh, of a of the zambia uh, plant. It was called a, a koti flour, and so they would make breads. And then they had all these uh, uh, nuts and fruits from the from the uh, forest, let's say. The tools we said we hunted with bows and arrow, fish and nets. Uh, okay, we we went to the right. Didn't we? Yeah. 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 I watched the, okay, I'm going, I'm going the wrong way, aren't I? Okay, yeah. you're right. Uh, all right, here we go. Pottery, uh, you know, it's nice pottery, but nothing like Wheaton Island. You know, the archaeologists just revere Wheaton Island, Tokabaga, or the uh, safety harbor culture, okay, but nothing like uh, Wheaton Island. So plain, basically plain pottery. Village architecture. Here's, here's safety, whoops, sorry. I'm sorry, I'm getting... Uh, Back You're getting button crazy. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm <coughs> sorry. I'm gonna, I'll get there. I'll learn it by the time we get done. Yeah. Safety Harbor. We were talking about that. They lived in thatch huts like this. Uh, yeah. It was basically always near a freshwater source, which is where you want your uh, your village so you can catch fresh water. Uh, they would have temple mounds and council houses, just as expected in a chieftain society. And then also a charnel house. A charnel house with a like a thatch hut like that, maybe fairly large. And when people would pass away, the the, the shaman or holy man would, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute, would have to prepare the body for burial or the bones for burial. And uh, so he would deflesh the bones. We'll talk about it. There's a whole I think there's a whole uh, uh, slide on that. Uh, and, 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 and then they would store these, they wrap them in a bundle and store them in a, in a hut like this for up to a couple of years until they decided to go add it to the burial mound. So you would always have a charnel house that was holding the bodies, the bone bundles of the dead awaiting to go into the burial mound. Uh, and they always had a, a central dance plot. So, let's see. Okay, so. We were talking about Anderson Navaya site here before. This is a, a real neat uh, uh, diagram, let's say, of, but, but done by Mac Perry. Uh, also, the Anderson Navaya site, where the, where the Jungle Prada is on Park Street. Mm. Uh, yeah, and this is just a, uh, here, here's Park Street right here. It goes up, and here's uh, uh, and that little, where the JP uh, Grill and Tap House is right now. and. Uh, and then there was there was mounds and middens to the north, and then they had a large uh, council house over here, a, a lodge for 300 people for council meetings, a dance plaza, uh, fresh water over here, and there was a, a creek over here, uh, and and and, uh, and 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 a whole. And this is the midden, the main midden, which we want to remind you again, that's the trash dump for the village. They wouldn't put their trash away. They, they didn't want to, they just dumped it on the side of the village. And we'll talk about what that meant to the, the smell of the village at the end there. Uh, anyway, they, uh, when, when Heavy Anderson bought this property, well, quite a few years ago now, because he's, he's passed away, but, but he built his house. Here's the Anderson house here. He put it on the dance plaza because there was no archaeological significance underneath it. So he wasn't uh, damaging any archaeological evidence. He put it on a dance floor, which is just basically a, a flat piece of ground where they danced everything. Uh, so we had, and then we had a, they had a burial mound out in the Gulf, of, uh, out in the intercoastal waterway, which was plowed over when they did the, the intercoastal waterway. They just tore that apart, and then there was a burial mound over here, and that was take, taken down in the, oh, I guess it was in the 40s to form the substrate of Park Street. All those bones are. 
under Clark Street. There was no control over uh, trying to save bundles and the dead. It's like putting your dead underneath your street and, and as they drown and support to the street. And there was no control, no federal law, no state law. Mm. So you did what you had to do. Anyway, it's interesting. Okay. Uh, so, okay. So, the clothing. That's interesting. The men all wore uh, breechcloths and then occasionally uh, of, of uh, deer skin. And occasionally they wear a cloak when they really had to either go to council or like going to church or to the shaman that, that had to do prayer. They put a cloak on, but most of the time it was just a breech cloth. Uh, and uh, they, 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 and the, the cloak went down to their mid thigh. Their hair was long, or occasionally they tied it up in a knot and put a, a, a bone uh, a pin through it. The women wore de uh, deerskin string around their waist. And I brought this for you women. <laughs> Get this, the women uh, wore a deerskin string, and then they would take Spanish moss <laughs> and hang it over the string. That's all they wore, this, this, this moss around. And uh, so there was a very, you know, it, it was just, it, maybe it looked beautiful to them, but it, it, it is strange uh, that they, the men would wear deerskin breechcloth, but they would, the women would wear uh, a weed like this. <laughs> yeah, the discrimination weed back then. <laughs> okay, so, and then the children wore nothing. Okay. Uh, but that, that was all recorded in the Spanish diary, you know, because it was, there were no cameras in it. I mean, just eyewitness. And in archaeology, you don't find that out because all you do is see ruins, you know, in the dirt. Then you had to have the Spanish tell you what you were. What really would they look like? Okay, so I've been teaching uh, at Eckerd College and, 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 and going to middle school and elementary schools, and and, and, that, and I always wore my uh, Native American regalia uh, deerskin cloak, tunic. Uh, it's a shaman's outfit, basically a shaman's outfit with uh, little skulls. Uh, and you know, and a, uh, some turkey feathers, some uh, wolf uh, skin decoration, uh, uh, and and so I I would wear this when I go to schools because the kids just you know I became an artifact, and I could then explain what 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 this all meant. Yeah. Uh, uh, they, they would they, they don't have patience to look at a bunch of stuff on a table. They they like to see somebody that looks like an Indian. So I did that. Well, then, then, then I'd always get, when I went to uh, Eckerd College and Sammy College, I'd get a student coming, are, are you part Native American? And I said, well, I don't know. I don't know. But I've been studying this and working this for 30 years. And, I, and as a kid, I just loved Native Americans and powwows and that. So I must have some Native American DNA. Well, I finally decided, well, I better find out. So I, uh, I, I got my 23andMe DNA uh, analyzed two years ago. And here's who I am. My mother's a McKinney and Irish. My father's a Malacca German. So 30%, roughly 31% of those. And then some other scattering things. Zero. Native American. American. Zero. <laughs> <laughs> but, but just a second. Neanderthal variants. I had, they tell me that I have more than 85% more Neanderthal than any other Native American, uh, than any American in America right now. I, I've got. Way more Neanderthal than normal people. And my wife said, they didn't have to tell me that. <laughs> anyway, so with that report, I could not wear that regalia ever again. Because I'm not Native American. I always hid behind a well, I don't know. But now I know. So I, I donated it to the museum here. Here's the regalia right here. So now it's, now it's useful in the museum as, as, as an outfit that, that can now look, uh, be okay because it's just a, a mannequin. And uh, I have to, you know, and, and he, I don't know if you can, not much light here, but I can it's, turn got, it it's got, it's got, he, he, on his yeah. necklace here, he's got an elegant foot. An elegant was a major, major food source for them. Uh, uh, and uh, he would uh, uh, always wear his hair long. And, and then, uh, thank you. 
And since this is a shaman, he would all, whenever he prepared a body for burial, he would cover uh, on a boat a skull. Because it said that, that's his saying that I did everything possible <coughs> so that you will go to the other world properly. And so he's got around 30 around his chest now and about 100 here. And so he's, he's now, this is his census of how many people he's buried. So it just, it just symbols all tradition. He also carries a stone point on his neck because they have a strong ancestral worship. If those paleo people, like we see over here in this paleo uh, display here, where we had these mastodons and, and all these large, you know, ancient animals 10,000 years ago, if those paleo people weren't here, they were the original people here, these guys were, because they're the descendants of that paleo type. So you always honor your descent, your, 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 uh, your ancestor. That's ancestral worship, putting that there thing. If, if you weren't there, I wouldn't be here, so I appreciate you being here. So all this stuff is, is all symbolic. He's a shaman, so he carries a staff of office, beaver skull, uh, which is you know one of his spirit companions that helped him do his work, uh, bear, uh, for a, a black bear, uh, that help, is one of his spirit companions too. So all, all stuff you can talk about uh, of what a shaman, all this symbolic stuff, ancestral worship, and spirit companion, mainly animals. So it, it's, a, it's, a good, it, it's a good thing in the museum, not on me, because I'm not Native American. Okay. Okay, so we, we talked about that, we talked about that, and then we talked about those two. Uh, okay, and here's Herman Trapman. He's, he's an artist in Pinellas County, terrific artist. Uh, and he's, he's done a lot of uh, artwork like this where they, they use dugout canoes. Uh, and you notice they've got a bow and arrow here, a big shell hammer. See, he's, he's trying to club that, that hammerhead uh, shark here. See that? Up here? Yeah. And, uh, and then they're just grabbing uh, on a net the fish here for the evening meal. Let's go. Another one. Uh, here they're bringing in the dugout canoes with uh, fish. And all the seabirds around, and here's the woman uh, with her. You can't see her uh, uh, Spanish wa uh, Moss. Her, her her skirt, <laughs> but she's topless. <laughs> it's it's authentic. It's as authentic as an artist can make, uh, and not have been there. Okay. And you saw that uh, that shell hammer. Here's a shell hammer made by one of our archaeologists here. Uh, I, I needed one for my uh, demonstration, my teaching. And he says, well, uh, you want me to make one that's just for show or one that is real? I said, well, make me the real one. So he got his big eastern whelk shell, and he carves a notch in this edge here, and it drills with a stone, a hole in the top, sticks the handle through, and takes some uh, deer skin and wets it down, and then uh, it, it dries and it locks it in, to, and it tightens on itself. And then you keep a, a, a stone to keep this sharp, and you can cut down any tree, any tree out here you can cut down in a matter of a day if you're big and strong. Because this is unbreakable in this axis. It's like steel. So it, it's a shell hammer like this is, is what they use to make those dugout canoes to, to chip them out. And uh, uh, it, it's, it, it's, they were very resourceful, let's say. And so here's the dugout canoe like you saw in that art. Uh, they, they're actually helping because they're controlling a fire on the top of the log. So it burns a little while, then they scrape out the ash, keep it burning. So all they have to end, at the end do is just scrape it out with one of these and make it smooth. Okay. Almost the entire village, a Tokobaga village, was all these thatched huts, everything made of wood or palm or plants. And so all of this stuff is made by natural materials. Uh, and, and so you have to maintain them and reproduce them on a regular basis because in a year or two, all these will go to hummus. Will all just disappear, will just go to the crap in this forward environment. So 50% of the time of village activity of people is actually doing maintenance and replacing the tools that are already used every day. So that, that means that you've got a village of uh, maybe 100 people, 
and half of them every day are replacing the, the, the tools and repairing the huts because it's, the Florida environment is so detrimental to this wood and plant environment. Okay, spirituality. The Tokabaga revered the, the spirit world and their natural world. I mean, they were extremely tied to, uh, let's say, uh, spirituality. They continued the burial custom of the Wheaton Island and, and, you know, and, and, and prepared uh, the skeletal remains and had a charm house to store them until they went to bury them up. And they used these two, two spirit people <coughs> heavily to prepare the bone bundles. So this is how this was, this is the process. Person passes away, the parent, you know, of course the, the family is lamenting and, and they hold a little ceremony of remembering this person, but the shaman and his team of people now have to go and take that body and prepare it for a burden, bone bundle. And so that's what they do. They deflesh the skeleton, not the family is away, they don't see that, and, and they deflesh it by boning the bones for a couple of days. Mm. They are, the bones are, and its major skull and bones are clean, wrapped in a deer skin and placed and stored in this wooden platform of the village called the Terminal. The, they, are, they are stored there for up to a year or maybe more. Every night the, the, the teenagers are out there guarding from predators like wolves and, and uh, mountain lions or cougars wanting to come in and, and chew on those bones. So you have to have guards every night. Uh, and then at some point, uh, uh, you, you'll start and you'll transfer all these bone bundles, maybe 100 or 200 years in mass, onto a layer in the, in the burial mound and then you cover it over with dirt. Uh, and, and each each bone bundle would take, have a piece, a small piece of pottery that would be placed with the person that he, would, he or she would take to the other world. Just a tradition. Okay. Uh, okay, the shaman was the, the doctor and the priest. So that, that's, that's a little different than today. But they would use rattles to say prayers. So I brought a few here. Here's a Florida rattle, a coconut shell with some seeds in it, rabbit's fur. And whenever the shaman or uh, that would want to say a prayer, he wanted the spirit world to turn its ear to hear his prayer, or his, he's just voicing in to the wind. So he shakes the rattle, and the, he knows the spirit world has turned its ears to you, and he says his prayer. And, and hope, hopefully the spirit world hears the prayer and, and accepts it and, and, and understands it. Here's a, another giraffe, seed pot, seed pods. Just common seed pods. Heck of a voice for a rattle. Same process. And here, a deer toenail rattle. You know, deers have, you don't do anything with the toenails, but it's a, it makes a heck of a rattle. And a shell rattle. A little shell with some other shells in it and covered with leather. Kind of a soft voice, but the cerebral has big ears. It hears it, and it, it alerts and hears your prayer. So, the spiritual, yeah, spirituality was really controlled by, by rattles announcing a prayer. Okay, let's keep going. <clears throat> and a shaman's rattle. Oh, I think I might have forgot to bring that. That's okay, we don't need that. Yeah, that's okay. We don't need that. Um, now, here's, the artist, here's another Florida, uh, uh, Pinellas County artist, Dean Quigley. In fact, his art is over... I think that's a Dean Quigley piece of art right there. I think it is. Anyway, uh, this is his rendition of a site uh, on Park Street, just north of the in our Anderson Narvaez site, called, and it's called Bayshore Homes. It's up where Abercrombie Park is, in that area, right at the corner of Tyrone and Park Street. And this is his uh, artist's rendition of what that village looked like. A big council little house over here, a burial mound to the, towards the water, and a Channel House right here where the bone bundles are stored. And then they dance for here uh, for, for nightly dances. 
And here's that site you can see. Uh, uh, here's Park Street here. Oh, it's going up here, and then, and then uh, this is the, and, you know, uh, here this is Tyrone Boulevard, basically, if you want to think of it that way. And and uh, and here's where you know, Quigley's. Uh, um, uh, uh, he was standing over here, and so he got that. He made that picture from roughly this part of the site. But this is all full of homes now, you know. And so, but this is a very famous uh, uh, site because this was all uh, excavated, you know, in, quite a few years ago. Here, right here, this is Abercrombie Park, right here. Uh, and there was a shell mound, and, and you still see signs of that shell mound in Abercrombie Park right now. Here's the Cutler Mound, uh, uh, where Carl Cutler lived, a nice mound still existing. And then, and then some uh, mounds along the, uh, the, the north front there. And here's what it looks like with all these uh, houses up there now. But underneath those houses, that site still exists. I mean, you, you, you don't tear it all up, you build on top of it. Okay, okay. So here's 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 one of the most exciting things that I, I learned this this time around with this this uh, presentation. In the they did the Bay Shore Homes excavation, and they they they, they excavated Mound B, which was the major uh, mound, uh, very mound at the site, and uh, and so the, the, this was now uh, this was the uh, basically the. Uh, they dated the site as to roughly uh, this time frame. So it was, it's still Safety Harbor, but it's early Safety Harbor, let's say. You know, the Spanish arrived right here in the 1500s. So it's still uh, Tocobaga, but it's, but it's early Tocobaga. And here for the first time in a ar archaeological setting, they assigned this PhD uh, uh, physical anthropologist to examine 115 of these skeletons. Uh, mainly, as I said before, when they find a burial mound, they would they would either destroy it or they would use it for for the base of a street like like Park Street. They, they didn't care about the the bones and that. There was no law. Now you never could even go near. You'd go in. You wouldn't even first of all you wouldn't even exit it. You'd leave it. But uh, but uh, but if you got the bones, you put them in archives and study them for decades. Okay, so. So, but he got to look at 115 of over 500 that were actually buried here. And this, and, and he's a physical anthropologist. He's not an archaeologist. He's like a, a bone uh, researcher. And so he found, uh, looking at those burials, some fantastic information. The men averaged five foot six and a half. Those were the giants <laughs> compared to the Spanish. The Spanish call those guys giants. Uh, the women were just two inches shorter, average. They were thin and wiry, kind of very light. Not, not chunky, but kind of like Hollywood types. <laughs> but because they, were, they, were, they supposedly were healthy, see? So, okay, muscular bodies. They could pull that bow back, the Spanish couldn't. Uh, and they all, from the bones, he could say they all walked on the outside of their feet. Now, why is that? I don't know. But he says, I can see that, that they did not walk on the flat of their feet. They walked on the edges of their feet. Uh, and the face, they had large faces, foreheads tall, uh, jowls, all handsome features. You know, he could make that the sermon just from the bones. Okay. The skulls were thick, and, and he measured every skull. The skulls were wider than all average Native Americans that he knew of. Can you believe that? Uh, so he stated, oh, sorry, here. I'm sorry. He, he surmised, based on that, that cranial, cranial shaping was prevalent in this society, which meant that uh, I, I, I worked in archaeology for 30 years here and never heard an archaeologist ever say anything about uh, uh, cranial shaping of the skull because archaeologists don't even get near a, a, a skeleton. It, it's like the kiss of death as an archaeologist. You don't want to get near it. You, you look at pottery. You look at other mundane things, but not body. Well, here, this guy is reporting that, that the uh, cranial shaping was done on all these guys. And it's because... 
if your head is, uh, if your your forehead is wide and it goes back, it gives you a more handsome appearance. It's not this round cue ball like all of us. It, it's, it's it's flattened back and it's wider and it gives you that, and both women and women as well too. It, it gives you this more handsome adulthood look, and so they did it to every child. Isn't that amazing? And so. Uh, Okay, and so you know you, you hear about flatheads out in the far west, uh, a tribe called flatheads. Well, they did it too. In fact, almost all Native America did it at one time, just because they were vain. They were it was vanity. Uh, they had long, strong, really long, strong teeth. No tooth decay because uh, they didn't eat corn. They eat they eat fish, seafood, and, and, and vegetables. Uh, but every jaw had signs of infection. Underneath the teeth, the jaw was infected. That's what he found. Uh, and the teeth were worn down half length because they were eating sand in their, because they were eating you know, fish and sand, and they were grinding their teeth every day from eating. Uh, and they used their teeth as tools too. And here's, and then they had some, the bones looked like they were, had healthy tissues of them. Even though this was hundreds of years later, he could discern that from the bones, which is amazing. Okay, and so here's some examples of, you know, cranial shaping in the past. There's uh, Inca up on the upper left. That's uh, in Egypt. That was cranial shaping, you know, binding the head so it went back, kind of oblong. But the Indians did it this way, where they took a board and, and flattened it against the child so that you ended up with a forehead looking like that. <laughs> Whether that's handsome or not, that's up to the individual. <laughs> Okay, so this is what he found. He analyzed these 115 individuals. 80% of them died before they were 35 years old. Can you believe that? 33% of the bodies he found died before age 12. Child fatality, uh, you know, mortality. Then 25% before age 25, you know, so, so you, you get up to age 35, 80% of them were, were dead before, he, uh, before 35, and nobody over 50. So you think, well, that's shocking co compared to today, but of course we have all this modern medicine, so we're all way beyond our <laughs> normal <laughs> death time here. We're pretty lucky. Uh, anyway, but see, similar problems like that occurred in Europe. You know, they were all uh, diseased, and, and, and so, uh, that, was, that, that was typical, that was nothing surprising because Europe had, at that time, back in the 1500s, had the same kind of mortality. So what was the cause of all this thing? I mean, I, I think that's kind of shocking to me. Let's see. Okay. Okay, every skeleton had, uh, at, just in the back, had arthritis. Every skeleton, even the kids. Isn't that amazing? That you, know, you think of kids, they, they have healthy bones. Well, they even had arthritis as, as children. Uh, they, 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 they all had, even the children had, let's see here, signatures of skeleton lesions on their bones and porous bones on their skull. All of them had these lesions, uh, signatures, you know, uh, marks on the bone where there was a, uh, a, a infection or, or uh, a real. Uh, a problem like a, a, a disease. He diagnosed that after he looked at it all, he had many people look at it, that they had endemic syphilis. All of them almost had syphilis. Not vernial syphilis, endemic syphilis. Syphilis caused by bacteria. And uh, so there was a systematic disease going on in the Bayshore homes, and this is early Tocobaga, remember? I said it was around 900. So it's the, the people who lived here before the, the Spanish got here. So there was a systematic tribal disease going on. And I don't care if you are a shaman or not, no shaman's rattle is going to eradicate that disease. That's going to get you. you know, he, the shaman had no control over something that, that strong and compelling attacking you every day. Every one of them had this disease. <coughs> Okay, 
So they appeared strong and healthy. They were the giants, the strong bull pillars. And they, they had all this great seafood. But they had this horrendous mortality rate going on. And uh, they had all these, uh, uh, they had infections in their jaws, they had arthritis, and this endemic syphilis. So my question when I read that was that, okay, that's, that's now around 800, 900 AD. We're talking about 1500. This is six, 700 years later, you know. That can't be the case for the token Bible. They could have, you know, well, it was because I got the Holy Grail. This book I discovered, read it back, for, back and forth two or three times now. It's by a guy named Dale Hutchinson. He's at University of North Carolina, just retired. He's what they call a bioarchaeologist. He's a anthrop uh, physical anthropologist and an archaeologist combined. And what he decided to do is look at all the archives of the Southeast and Florida, specifically, all the burial bundles. He went to every archive, every museum at Florida State, Gainesville, all over, and looked at every bone bundle over all the time from uh, like way back in time and all the way up to when the Spanish got here. And, and one guy looking at it, so you had this consistent assessment of what he's looking at. Because all these other ones were done by different guys, they had all different criteria what to look at. He looked at them all. And he found out some pretty specific, shocking stuff. This, this guy is really top drawer. Uh, he found that the, uh, uh, he had this consistent set of eyes at all the bone bones. So he found that, that in, when he looked at all these and when they were buried, that, that what happened was around eight, around eight, 900 AD, the population in Tampa Bay started to increase. Uh, you were getting more people, uh, the, the weather was good, they had good uh, uh, fishing seasons, and so uh, over that time, uh, up to 900 AD, the, 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 the people, the population was increasing, and all that did was cause this disease to spread faster. You know, it was, it was like, all, you know, in other words, you don't have this isolation of villages. That you have more people and you get more uh, disease. It's illogical. And, uh, and he confirmed the vulnerability of the Tocobaga when the Spanish arrived. He, he, did a diet, he did an isotope analysis of all the bones and found that, well, he just found what the archaeologists knew all along, is that they're fit, they had a big, strong uh, marine diet with some um, supplanted by animals and plants, but he had isotopic signatures to verify it in the bones. All of them had this, uh, uh, they had, all of them, this is new now, uh, he discovered new that the skulls were very porous, which was caused by an iron deficiency anemia, uh, a bony skull, and it was caused because they were eating undercooked seafood. And that causes an anemia, which caused the, the skull to get porous. So that was attacking them all the time. They didn't know that. You know, they, were, they didn't have doctors like now could say, well, you, you got to cook your fish. They, 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 they were just trying to survive. All of them had degenerative joint disease, as we found out from previously with the uh, Bayshore home, and trauma. Very limited sh uh, show of trauma. So when we talked about the Calusa and the Tocobaga and the Ocali competing over territories, well, it was just basically pushing back and forth. There was no war. Because if there had been war, you'd find in those barriers all kinds of broken bones and all kinds of uh, you know, uh, signs of warfare. He did. He just found uh, accidents and domestic man and woman violence, which is in every society. So, you know, he, he says that it's it just normally no significant warfare by the, by the, by the trauma. Okay. okay, he found skeletal lesions uh, and, and the bones were, were 20, at least 20% on all site and up to 58% at Crystal River. So it said that the endemic stiffness was real. It went all the way through the, to the Toka Bayou site when the Spanish arrived. And it was caused by this, uh, in, this trepanomal palladium, which is a, a, a bug, or a, uh, a, 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 a really a, a micro, uh, micro uh, 
Um, I, I just don't want a book because I'm not a doctor. I don't know that. Uh, uh, and there was no, absolutely no venereal syphilis signs. So when the Spanish arrived, and the, you know, in 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 Fontaneda discussed how big and strong they were, and all that, well, they were extremely compromised. They're 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 and, and now we've had this uh, pandemic going on. We know that our immune system is always under attack, and we got to have these boosters that build the antibody so it can. Uh, continue to do the death. Well, these guys didn't have that. And so they, 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 all these lesions and all these diseases were there, and they looked strong, but their immune system was really stressed. And so it was, it was, they were almost at the point of, uh, of insurvivability, even though they looked strong and, and, you know, and, and, and uh, healthy. But, but when the Spanish then arrived with all their new diseases from, the, from the Europe, and we'll talk about that in a second, uh, they, they couldn't survive. Because here's Herman Trappen's uh, great piece of art where this is, this is his, uh, 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 let's say, a piece of art that says, this is when Narvaez landed outside by the Anderson Narvaez site, in the, where now is the intercoastal water. And the people looking out and wondering what's happening there. And, and then this is the beginning of the end when the Spanish arrived. Because the Spanish introduced all these diseases that were never present in the New World here. And, and of course, you know, you know, all these, and of course they brought in the venereal disease as well. Anyway, all, all this tipped the scales. This tipped the scales. They were already you know, vulnerable, and now all of a sudden those new diseases went right through the population. and. Okay, so they were struggling by these systematic disease, and their immune systems were really under attack, and, and then there was no resistance. And by, you know, in a matter of 50 to 70 years, the Togobaga were history. And they were proud people, but they had no way to control it, no, no way to combat it. And, uh, and so they faded it from history. And so that's why I called them the lost tribe, one of the lost tribes in Florida. Uh, but this may have happened even without that the prevalent disease present, because these European diseases were all new, and their immune system had no way of most likely uh, withstanding it. But they were compromised, so they had zero way to come uh, to, uh, uh, to, to uh. so uh, so uh, you can't say that. This happened because the Europeans got it. Well, it did, but but it, but it, it would have, could have happened whether uh, they didn't have these existing diseases or not, because it was so prevalent. The disease, the new diseases from Europe, were so uh, uh, difficult. Let's see here. Come on. There you go. Oh, am I going to? Well, I, uh, I got okay, here we go. <laughs> Gotta have somebody do this for me. <laughs> then, okay, then so then then so so then you know the Tokabago basically uh, not all disappeared, but mostly disappeared, and and all the other tribes did too in Florida. And so then it, it just in the 1700s, uh, tribal groups from up in the uh, south southeast here, you know, from uh, the, from Alabama, Mississippi, the you know, Creek and Choctaw, Chuck. Chickasaw, they were being forced to try to go on the reservations, and they, they came into Florida because it was basically empty. They, were, they, they tried to escape to Florida. And then these people then settled in Florida. They gathered up what other remnants of the Tokaba that were trying to live out in the swamps, uh, and so who survived. And it's those northern tribal groups, along with the survivors of the Tokabaga, that were still around, and that's the people that became known as the Seminole. So, when I when we talk to the Seminole people, and I do that uh, in, in the trail and other uh, organizations I run. They still the Seminole say because they don't think of anything. They'll say, "Well, we, we gathered up a couple of guys out in the uh, out in the, uh, the Pomato, and so the blood of the Tokabaga rises in our veins. So if there's anything to be capitalized on." We're part of the Tokabog as well, so they're 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 you know they're just a a, a very smart uh, you know always taking advantage of whatever uh, they can with a, and with a casino as well. 
Okay. So they claim that the total volume of blood runs into your brain. And we could probably, so here's, here's really, if you look at all of America, you know, a bunch of professors have said, okay, when the Spanish arrived, what was the population uh, in 1492 when Columbus arrived? And they, they, you got these professors making estimates. And you can see what they've done. In general consensus, if you, you take, mash them all together, from two to 10 million existed when the Spanish, when, when Europeans arrived. So, and then they brought all of these diseases. So then 90 to 95% of the native population, poof, disappeared through disease. And, uh, and so in the census, census of 1900, U.S. census showed only 250 Native Americans living, which is a 95% loss of population. And, and now uh, uh, Indian population is about 3 million, so they're coming back, but that's because of modern medicine. And you know that all these diseases are under control. Of. But anyway, it, it's a really sad story from a endemic, Viewpoint, and we're all sensitive to them with the COVID and all that, and we're all trying to live, you know, good and trying to avoid these issues. But the Tokabaga weren't able to do that. So, okay, the history is not a happy one, but let's talk about, you know, we we kind of think of the Tokabaga here, and you know, before the Spanish arrived, or even when they arrived. But let's say beforehand, they're living in these thatched huts. They, they look healthy. They've got 50 in Pinellas County, there's 50 uh, village sites. And you know, we showed that architecture of the village where you got the mounds and the middens, the trash heaps uh, around the village. Uh, because every time you you fix some fish, you take the guts and the skin and you throw them on the, on the midden, which is the trash heap. And in the leftovers from uh, dinner, you throw it on the trash heap. You have your own latrine, of course, but, but that's different. So anyway, so you look at, think of yourself in this village. All the waste of the hunting, the fishing, and shellfish every day is tossed on the mid. And then the body hygiene, probably suspect, but they would go out and golf maybe and, and clean up maybe once a day. The resting dead in the turtle house, all these bone bundles sitting there for a year. Can you imagine the flies, the ants, and the gnats, and the mosquitoes? In that environment, we have control here. They had no control. And then there was the, then there was a local latrine, and that was right in the village. So you have to walk a long time. Well, uh, can you imagine now what what the village smelled like? But that was normal life for them. Uh, but but we have a different thing. So if you think of what that village must have been like, with all the mosquitoes and gnats and flies and the order from the trash heaps, and whatever. It's not an idyllic image. So, when you reminisce about these people, we need to be realistic. They were vulnerable, thus they were lost. But their sites, their mounds, you see it in all these parks, Safety Harbor, Anderson Navias, and Abercrombie, there's all kinds of sites. You still see their mounds, the evidence of their mounds, or their, their burial mounds. They, they, they still evoke a presence and their heritage. And so there's still signs of it, but, but they're all gone. They're, they're, the people are gone, and the results of their, I'll call it civilization or life, is still on the landscape. But, uh, but and we just have to think about them that, well, they just, they, they were they were had bad timing with the England with the Spanish coming. Wonderful. But, but, but let me just make one final comment. Guys like Dale Hutchinson and then Dr. Snow, when you look at the bones, and of course we don't uh, we don't quite do that today, but your your skeleton tells all your secrets. <laughs> all that you've experienced in life, accidents, disease. It's the signatures are on your skeleton. And, and so that's, there's no secrets from a forensic anthropologist. He knows it all. <laughs> Great. Yeah.